introduction, your opening remarks. Uh, thank you also to um, our colleagues on the management team, Silvia Razzani and Janina Klingenhöfer, uh, for the great collaboration on creating this uh, virtual series. And uh, last but not least, of course, many thanks to IPRA, the International Public Relations Association, which uh, is endorsing uh, this series. My name is Florian Meissner. I'm a professor of media management and journalism at Macromedia University of Applied Sciences in Cologne. And it's my pleasure to chair this panel on what COVID-19 teaches us with regard to uh, risk and crisis communication research and practice. Uh, and I'm delighted to have four excellent keynote speakers uh, on the panel. Florian, you're muted currently. Can't hear you. Oops, sorry. Ah, thank you. So no, my. You're muted again. Okay, something's happening here. I'm uh, activating my microphone and then. Somebody might be muting though. I don't know who's the chair of this session, session but the, those person who started the session can make it possible that only you are allowed to turn on and off microphones. It seems that somebody is turning off your microphone. Thank you, Holger. I think, uh, yeah, something's going, going um, a little bit strange here because uh, my mic was clearly activated, but uh, then it's uh, going on mute again. Okay, I'm, I'm trying again. I was thanking everybody, the entire management team and, and IPRA, the International Public Relations Association, for collaborating uh, on this uh, panel and on the entire virtual series Crisis 2021. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, it's uh, very important for us as a community to come together this way at times when we can't have any conferences. So I'm really thankful for everyone who contributed to, um, to this panel and to the uh, entire series. Um, I don't know what you've heard uh, about my self-introduction, but I'm uh, Florian Meissner, um, Professor of Media Management and Journalism at Macromedia University of Applied Sciences. And um, I was just about to uh, introduce to you uh, the four keynote speakers. So that's what I'm doing right now, and I'm uh, and I hope that my mic won't go on mute again while I do this. So, um, sorry. So these are our four keynote speakers. Uh, the first keynote will be delivered by Philipp Barremans, who is an emergency risk and crisis communication consultant. He has done strategic communication projects, projects for epidemic and pandemic preparedness across the globe, for instance, with the World Health Organization, with the European Union, with the West African Union. Uh, so a lot of impressive work. Uh, and since January, uh, he is the president of IPRA. Uh, the topic of his keynote is crisis and emergency risk communication, the need for an integrated approach. Welcome, Philippe. The second keynote will be delivered by Jan Jin, a professor uh, of public relations at University of Georgia. Among her fields of specialization are crisis communication and health risk communication, including on the role of uh, emotions and of social media as well. Uh, she's done a lot of impressive work on that um, uh, and also she's in charge uh, as editor of a forthcoming special issue of the journal of international crisis and risk communication research that is related to COVID-19 so i recommend you to to have an eye on that um, she's going to present on gaining insights from a multi-methodological approach to crisis learning and pandemic communication management and i'm really glad to have you on the panel thanks for joining us the third keynote speaker is Matt Seeger, Professor of uh, Communication and Dean of the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts at Wayne State University in Detroit. Uh, his work on crisis communication has been published in more than 200 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. Uh, for instance, uh, the second edition of his book, Theorizing Crisis Communication, with Timothy Selnow, has just come off the press, so congratulations on that. And he's going to present on communicating death and dying during crises, uncertainty, equivocality, and strategic ambiguity. Welcome, Matt. 
And finally, we have Andreas Schwarz uh, on the panel. He's the chair of the Department of Public Relations and Communication of Technology at Ilmenau University of Technology in Germany. And uh, his research interests include journalism, public relations, and cross-cultural communication research. And he's one of the founders of ICREA's Crisis Communication Division and over many years has been its chair. So we wouldn't be here without him. So thanks for that. And he's going to present on internal risk and crisis communication on the COVID-19 pandemic, global experiences of higher education institutions. Andreas, many thanks for, uh, to you as well for joining us. So this is the, the outline for today. And just to uh, let everyone know, I'm going to finish my screen sharing here. Uh, and just to let everyone know, um, we are going to hear the keynotes consecutively. Uh, so in case you have any quick questions for clarifying uh, things, it's, it, it's okay to ask uh, right, in, uh, right after every uh, keynote, of course. Uh, but if you have bigger remarks or questions, we ask you to save them for the discussion part in the second half of the session. And or you can also use the chat anytime when you have comments, when you have questions uh, or remarks and get the discussion there as well. So these are the two options for you as audience to participate uh, in the panel. OK, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the keynotes and now I'd like to uh, ask Philippe to present the first keynote. Crisis and emergency risk communication, the need for an integrated approach. OK, thank you. Let me uh, start sharing my screen. In just a second. There you go. That should be the correct screen that you're seeing now. Looks good. Voila, that should be it. So, um, well, first of all, thank you for for this invitation. It's um, I, I have a, two hats on as a, as a, a consultant, but also as the president of Vipra. And one of the topics that uh, one of the actions that we wanted to do this year uh, with Vipra is reach out to other associations. And so this came together. This was a perfect mix of a topic where I'm passionate about because it's my job as well. Uh, but also uh, because IPRA is, is looking to collaborate with other associations and that uh, science-based communication is one of the topics on the board's agenda for uh, 2021. Um, so thank you very much for that invitation. Maybe a, a little bit of background. So um, yes, I'm originally from Belgium. I, I live in, in Portugal for the moment. Before that, I used to live in, in Morocco. I'm an ex-IBMer, uh, so I come out of the private sector um, and currently serving as president of the International Public Relations Association. Uh, my, my job day in, day out is working for organizations like the WHO, uh, GIZ, the, the German uh, Development Agency and the European uh, Union um, in the context of um, epidemic and pandemic preparedness and then more specifically around emergency risk communication. Now, this is not something that I studied or that I was previously trained for. Uh, I have a background in public relations. I come out of the private sector where I quickly specialized in crisis communications. And it was four or five years ago where I had the opportunity to just uh, do a very small mission of a month uh, at WHO in, in Geneva where I I saw where people started to correct me when I said, oh, you're doing crisis communication. I said, no, 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 this is emergency risk communication. So I, I felt immediately that there was like a perceived difference. And I now know that there is a difference, but also very strong similarities. And um, this is the topic of, of what I wanted to share with you. Now, uh, again, uh, I am not an academic. This what I'm going to um show now, present now, and the questions I'm asking now are purely based on my experience in the field. Uh, it's not based on research, 
although I do uh, dive into the latest research now to see if if my idea or my perception is correct or not correct or or if it stands as such. Uh, but this is simply based on four or five years of missions across the globe uh, in in you know fighting epidemics and now since the start uh, of last year uh, the uh, the current pandemic. So uh, be gentle, <laughs> uh, but I would I would have uh, I would love to have a, a, a lively discussion because again this is something that I feel very strongly about and uh, my whole idea here is that uh, I would love to see uh, emergency risk communication professionals and crisis communication professionals get together um, and and share experience and share knowledge uh, because my ID now or my feeling now is that it's not happening enough. So let me kick this off just also by giving you a bit of background of IPRA. I'll be very short. So the association is an international one. Uh, we were founded in 1955. It's one of the oldest public relations associations in, in the world. Uh, it's also one of the founding members of the International Code of Ethics, which is known as the Code of Athens. Um, that was set up in 1965. We are a recognized organization uh, as international non-governmental organization by the United Nations. And we do have a consultative status, uh, which is something that I feel very strong about as well. We have, as public relations professionals, a very important role. Uh, and that allows us to work together with the different UN institutions. And then uh, every single year, we have our big moment in the year that where we also... Sorry, Sorry this has... Did someone have a question? Am I still audible? Do you still hear me? Yeah, we do. Fine. We do. Okay, I just I just heard someone. Okay, it was just background. Good. Um, and then one of the moments in the year that we have is the uh, IPRA Golden uh, World Awards, where we uh, recognize excellence in public relations and public relations meaning not only media relations, right? So it's the full strategic level of public relations. And uh, that is both for uh, non-profit, academic and private sector uh, organizations, companies and agencies. Uh, we, lo we look at all those. Uh, the board and several other members are then um, as a jury. Uh, it's a pretty serious job that we take as well very seriously. Uh, it takes a couple of months to go through all those case studies. Uh, but we do think it's important because one of the things I feel is that the public relations industry is not sharing good case studies enough so that we can learn from each other. So that's a very important moment. I'll, I'll stop here around IPRA and let me get into uh, the topic here. I have both experience in crisis communications from the corporate side and emergency risk communication from uh, the health, uh, public health side. And when we look at corporate, uh, the corporate side of a crisis, uh, it is, and, and I've been trained like this at least, that it's about protecting reputation and the value of an organization in the private sector. And that is a, a, the, the, main, uh, the main objective there in the context of crisis comes, is setting up a dialogue between the organization and the publics um, before, during, and after uh, something negative occurs. Now, already from experience, the before is something that is often forgotten and, and many, many organizations are surprised when something happens and then turns into a crisis. So that's already something that I've, I've seen during my 10, 15 years in the private sector that the before, the preparation, is not something that is uh, most of the time on the agenda. It does change year on year, but it, again, there's much more work to be done. But the focus here is on protecting reputation and the value, so it's about image and uh, damage uh, to the, the bottom line at the end of the day. When we look at um, the public side or the emergency risk communication side, the, the main objective here is saving lives and uh, ensuring stability. Uh, stability that could be political, social, cultural, but uh, human life protection is, is on the forefront. Um, and there it's about looking at individuals and um, communities um, to deliver information uh, so that they can protect themselves. Again, it's a different way of working. And also what we do in emergency risk communication, which doesn't happen in crisis comms, uh, is that we all accept 
that we are working with um, imperfect, not complete information when we start communicating. And that is a big difference that I see from the private sector crisis comes to emergency risk. In emergency risk, you accept that things are evolving, that you do not have all the information at a certain given moment, but you still communicate. You accept this imperfect nature of choices, as I put here on my slides. If you do that in crisis communication in the private sector, that is a big no-no, because you are working with, for instance, a legal department, which would triple check your, your first reactive statement, et cetera, et cetera. And we do not like uncertainty and non-complete information in the private sector. Again, there, that is a difference that I see, which is an interesting one. Now, um, corporate crisis comes, um, is sort of the need to communicate about a crisis to stakeholders or shareholders, because at the end of the day, uh, it is uh, a lot about shareholders. And uh, it is looking at uh, issues which have then turned into a crisis, and that could uh, cause harm to the organization's good reputation. But a big difference, again, is that the organization in this case is itself experiencing an unexpected crisis and must respond and is an active participant. And that is not always the case in emergency risk communications. So emergency risk comes most of the time the communicator or the organization which communicates is generally not perceived as a participant in the crisis or disaster, but is seen as an agent to resolve this crisis or emergency. It's more uh, about an expert opinion, giving consultancy, giving support, and also activating emergency risk communication tactics, uh, which are very much uh, geared to changing behavior or instilling action, which would ensure uh, rapid and active or efficient recovery from a certain event. Again, the outcome of the decisions that are taken in emergency risk communication um, are most of the time uncertain and are based on uh, imperfect or incomplete information, which again is not the case most of the time in crisis comms. So in, in short, uh, crisis comms, the communicator there is most of the time, if not always, an active participant in the crisis. The time pressure is there, it's urgent and unexpected, while it shouldn't be unexpected, and, and I'll go in more detail later on, and the message purpose, most of the time, again, in crisis comms is to explain and persuade, where in emergency risk comms, the expert, the communicator is the expert who is an after event participant invested in the ultimate outcome of the emergency or crisis. Um, of course, time pressure is there as well. And the message purpose, well, there is an add on. It's explaining, persuading, but also, and most of all, empowering decision making. As I said, the pieces of communications that you send out to your communities um, in an emergency situation is pieces of information so that they can help uh, themselves and make choices themselves to protect themselves and their community. It is another dynamic in crisis calls. Uh, I've spoken about emergency um, risk communication and then risk communication. Now, um, most of us will use these together and mix them up. Uh, I had one simple explanation by someone much more intelligent than I am uh, from WHO who said, look, Philip, you know, the difference between two is very simple. Risk communication is on the left. You have this discussion with your doctor and your doctor is saying, look, Philip, if you continue to smoke in a couple of years, you could have this and this and this and this. The emergency risk communication is the picture on the right where it's already too late. I continued smoking and people are operating on me. That is the simple definition. Again, I'll be using them and mixing them up, um, but that, it's, that, that is how we, how we look at things. The methods as well are a bit different. Uh, let's look at the life cycles. This is a full picture of an issues and crisis life cycle by Peter Sandman, which, which is something, someone that I, I follow um, his writings and his research as well. But it is complex. If you look at this, uh, you see that all these participants, all these little boxes have a role to play in uh, the different phases of a uh, issue slash uh, crisis. 
where an issue, of course, is a crisis that is a potential crisis, but you still have control. An issue which goes out of hand is then probably becoming the crisis. That's a small difference there. But if you look at those boxes, we have internal uh, communications, we've got uh, press relations, we've got public affairs, uh, we have stakeholder management, we've got legal, we've got CSR. All these different functions, professions, or departments in big organizations have a role to play in a different stages. In emergency risk comms, it is a life cycle which is simpler, maybe not less complex, but it is uh, more phased in the way that we look at the before, the during, and the after with different steps to take. Uh, and I like this simple approach where you look at resources depending on the stage that you are in. So we have a preparation stage, which is a continuous uh, activity uh, in emergency risk comms. We've got emergency that is then declared and the first response. Those two are very close to each other. And in the first response from a communications point of view, what you try to do is gain control or be, or be in control at least of the narrative, uh, which is then going to take over. Of course, there is the crisis then that happens. Afterwards, we have a recovery phase and then an evaluation phase. Now, again, this model is, is, is uh, ready to be reviewed because that evaluation phase and that, again, is a difference between crisis and emergency uh, risk comms. That evaluation phase, of course, should happen in every single stage and not just at the end, which is something that I've seen much more happening in the crisis communication slash corporate world than that I've seen happening in the emergency risk uh, public health uh, world. So the evaluation phase, which is a continuous um, activity, where um, now we'll, we're talking about the after action reviews uh, around, the, uh, around the pandemic. Those things should have happened uh, on a regular scale so that we could uh, change actions uh, much more quickly than has been done over the last year. If we look at the uh, life cycle of emergency risk comms, what is exactly happening in the preparation phase? It's drafting and testing messages based on different potential um, emergencies, which of course have been put into a risk analysis, which is ongoing. Uh, and one of the things when I speak with people from the private sector, when they say, yeah, well, who could have foreseen this pandemic? Then I go like, well, if you, if you look at the major international uh, risk analysis reports, there are a couple of them, the OECD brings one out, etc. And if you look at the national uh, risk analysis uh, within Europe, at least, you will see that in the top five for the last five years, epidemic slash pandemic was on there. So I would assume it shouldn't have been a surprise for many countries that this could happen and they should have been prepared for it. In the crisis private sector, of course, that is something that normally you wouldn't see on a traditional company risk uh, map, but still it is something to look at. Now, drafting and testing messages, that is something that is ongoing, developing partnerships, which is crucial for emergency risk communication because there is not one single agency and not one single government which can handle these things alone. Creating plans, of course, and then determining the approval processes because they are rather complex when you're dealing with uh, governments, communities, different partners, uh, and, uh, and health institutions in this case. Initial response is, is, and this is the guide, this is the handbook, uh, objective is expressing empathy, explaining risks, promoting action, promoting action. Again, it is making the, the communities, the affected communities, part of an action plan. It must, it's not just informing them, it's asking them to participate in protecting themselves and then also throughout, all the way throughout the recovery phase. And describing the response efforts, of course. Then later on, we have a sustained response because um, some uh, emergencies don't just go away uh, like this one, and some of them take years. Uh, it's explaining ongoing risks, segmenting audiences, which already should have happened before, but it is an ongoing segmentation, looking at uh, vulnerable populations, um, different cultural uh, communities, uh, social levels within uh, society, all these things, providing background information, and now, of course, addressing rumors. We all have heard about the infodemic. 
It is not something new. Again, uh, fake news is not something new either. We've got case studies going back to the 1800s and even before that. Uh, but it has played a huge role, uh, at least for the last 12 months, and now it has become a very specific topic within communications where people are being trained now in infodemic management, which is a good thing. Then, of course, motivating vigilance, discussing lessons learned in the after-action reports, but also um, uh, during the emergency, and then revising the plan. And again, revising a plan is something that I've seen happening uh, on a very regular basis because now we have the possibility to get the feedback from the ground and then immediately act upon that feedback and revise actions, plans, uh, be it strategic or um, tactical. The other thing which I find is, 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 is at least from a, from a professional slash mental point of view, uh, is the focus on human rights and on the on 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 the populations, which is different in in the in the crisis communication sector. There is a very introspective way of looking at crisis in the private sector, where it is about the brand, it's protecting our reputation, it's protecting our people, and not so much about looking at the communities around there. This is shifting, of course. Uh, CSR started to look at that, and then now, of course, every company is looking at their purpose and is looking at um, the um, sustainable development goals and so the, it, it is getting there in that direction but the first gut reaction of a company is looking at uh, is introvert and is looking at their own image and reputation where the first action in emergency risk communication is geared towards the communities involved and it is based on human rights it is immediately from day one looking at vulnerable population groups and it is looking at uh, identifying risks early and better targeting that risk communication depending on the different vulnerable population groups. Without, I don't think I have to explain that in an emergency, the very first uh, population groups that we look at are women and children because most of the time, if not all the time, unfortunately, uh, they are the most exposed to risk. What we also do is much more than in crisis comes is looking at uh, societal and cultural factors. Um, I have seen communication plans uh, around the pandemic coming out of the uh, private sector, which uh, simply go very broadly and work with the concept of the general public, which is a concept which doesn't work at all, uh, because there is no such thing uh, when we talk about risk and emergency risk communication, um, there is no such thing as the general public. And that is, again, another difference that I see where when I'm out in the field uh, working with teams, um, most of the time next to the communications team, if I have the luxury of having a team, um, I work with anthropologists. Um, I work with, with, of course, medical doctors specialized, but anthropologists, uh, local influencers, church leaders, uh, religious leaders. And we look at how these behaviors are, what is existing, what was the preconception, how, how is risk uh, perception different between men and women. We know it's different uh, globally, but how is that in that specific culture? How does that work? The gender roles, all these things. That is from the start that we work with. Um, and again, the difference between risk behavior and risk perception is something that is measured on a regular basis. The audiences uh, are, uh, of course, depending on their relationship to an emergency. So. We first look at survivors, first responders, public health professionals, and medical professionals. And only then are we going to the public outside of that scope, families of survivors, responders, and the media, second place. In crisis comes, the first place is media, which in itself, if you only look at it from a private sector point of view, is already wrong. I mean, I've worked in so many companies and in crisis teams as a consultant where, oh, something is happening, First thing on the agenda is the reactive statement. No, your first thing on the agenda should be your internal communications. Um, so that, that is already a, a false start in, in many cases. And then um, in the third phase, it's looking at the, the community at large, nation, region, trade, industry, international and officials. But the first focus is immediately people affected by the emergency. What we do then is looking at different things. We look at their primary concerns, personal safety, family safety, property damage, 
these kind of things. And then uh, in the community immediately outside of the affected area, it's how can they help? How can they um, protect themselves? Um, how can they uh, counter the fact that normal activities are disrupted? Again, a different dynamic uh, from the private sector or the crisis communications um, activity. These are the things that we work with in emergency risk communications, a huge amount of parameters that we look at, uh, psychographics, cultural norms, social norms, social networks, um, current and past behaviors, which is what is determining their behavior, beliefs, knowledge, risk perception. All these things are taken into account. It, it is a much more complex, uh, let's say, um, stakeholder analysis that we do than that I, again, have seen happening in the private slash crisis communications um, sector or profession. Community engagement, again, is, is, a, is a very typical thing. We call the teams that I work with uh, and that I'm part of are called RCCE teams, so risk communications and community engagement teams. That is now coming together. Both the communication part and the community part is coming together, and it does make sense. And we work with tools, which again, I haven't seen uh, being used a lot in, in the crisis, traditional crisis communications environment. I mean, already this, the, the simple thing of a CAP survey, knowledge, attitude and practice survey, which is a, a very practical tool, which is uh, common sense in emergency risk comms, is not something that I've seen uh, being used in the uh, crisis communications profession. And then, of course, you work with analysis, mathematical models, so much more science-based uh, uh, and, and data-driven communications than uh, I have experienced before. Key message development, again, uh, is also uh, a bit different. Um, a key message development in emergency risk comms is first looking at perception of risk and risk behaviors. So, Philip, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a, a very gentle reminder <laughs> to please come to an end soon if this is I'm, I'm coming. I think it's a, a couple of slides. That's it, but I'll keep it very short. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, the emphasis of the on the group versus the individual, so communities and cultures are very important, and then the credible sources of information. So it's really based on a two-way um, cycle of communication together with institutions, faith-based, uh, non-governmental organizations and communities. Um, again, we're looking at what can we do with these messages. These are the objectives that we uh, mainly use. Uh, we've got eight of them, and then we prioritize depending on what the emergency is and in which phase we are. So it could go from um, promoting risk reduction behavior to uh, resolving conflict or controversies. Takeaways. Uh, I want to end with this one because, again, that topic is, is very much important to me uh, and also uh, on the agenda of IPRA, but I think it's very important for all of us. Uh, this pandemic is not going away with vaccination. Um, we are talking about what we call the fourth wave, and the fourth wave uh, is already happening and is going to take us probably three to four years further from today. This is the impact of the pandemic on mental health on trauma, burnout, and then, of course, the economic injury. Um, it is one of the things that we forget about. So when we talk about risk communication, emergency risk, and crisis comms, it is the perfect time now for those professions to come together. Because we know that if you're working crisis comms or you work in emergency risk comms, we have a lot of work ahead of us, let alone just looking at the mental health issue that will be felt within private companies and in society on a national scale, on an international scale. I think that was the last one. Uh, I'm leaving you with this. Um, at the end of the day, this is something that I put on the wall everywhere I work, uh, just to remind me that it's not what you want to tell them, it's what they can hear. And that is what the basis is of good emergency risk slash crisis communication. It's taking into account what people want uh, to hear and what they can hear. Uh, depending on where they're coming from. So thank you all. Um, I hope I stayed in time. Um, thanks for the reminder, though, but it were the last slide. So uh, that was my uh, call to action. Let's come together as crisis communicators and emergency risk communicators on a, on a, um, on a common platform so that we can exchange experiences. Thank you so much, Philippe, for your insights. 
really interesting and uh, I think also a fruitful uh, presentation for the later discussion. Um, a question to the audience, are there any very quick uh, questions for clarification? Is this the case? So that would be the opportunity to, right now. If this is not the case, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Philippe just one question. Uh, on one of your first slides, uh, you mentioned the uh, global, the, the Golden World Awards, which we, we, we've also talked about in advance, um, and that may be also interesting for our members or for um, the audience today. Uh, it's a awards that uh, recognizes the excellence in public relations in a variety of, of disciplines and categories, uh, including uh, communication research. So maybe yeah, you definitely. can say a few so, uh, sentences uh, about that. No, from the start, we wanted to not make this the traditional awards that you now see, um, which is like best campaign, etc. It, it, it does include that, but we have very specific topics like you know, scientific communication, science-based communication. We also introduced a couple of new ones uh, because we see that our, our profession in communication in general is evolving. So we've got a new one, which is around virtual communication, uh, game-based communication, for instance, with great case studies coming out of that. And, uh, and that is interesting to see. So uh, yes, if anyone is interested, uh, go to the IPRA website. We've just opened now up uh, to start receiving the case studies. Uh, and then it will take us through the summer to go through them. And then we have the uh, announcement of, of the winners and the event, which will unfortunately still be a virtual one, I think. Uh, but yes, please do participate. I think it's important first, it's a recognition for your hard work. But at the same time, uh, those case studies are shared uh, across the globe. And I do think that we need to know uh, about each other's work. What went well? What are the challenges? Uh, what are those specific needs uh, and things that we can learn from each other? OK, thank you. I've just posted the link to the awards uh, on our chat. And I want to thank you again for your uh, keynote and hand thank it over you. Thank you very much uh, and um, hand it over to Jan, who is uh, going to present the second uh, keynote today, gaining insights from a multi-methodological approach to crisis learning and pandemic communication management. Jan, looking forward thank to your presentation. You. Yeah, and thank you for our first presenters. This is a fantastic stage for what I'm going to uh, share with you. So uh, let me uh, open the, share the slides here. OK, you can all see this OK? Yes. OK, perfect. All right, well, let's get it going. Well, so um, so what my presentation is kind of continuing building upon uh, our theme of sharing what we learned about crisis communication and also learning from academic research and also coming from insights from uh, practitioners, right? So quickly, um, some of those insights I'm going to share today is based upon uh, the accumulated work that from uh, members and also affiliated scholars and practitioners in our uh, crisis communication think tank at University of Georgia. So what is a think tank, right? So what, what we do is we started in 2018. So we start to bring in a group of crisis communication scholar and a group of crisis communication practitioners to be in the same space, same room to co-identify what are those industry-wide challenges, right? Uh, that's uh, issues that are complex, that's are challenging, that's not going away, that's reoccurring. I, I think pandemic or epidemic outbreaks are a classic example of those type of crisis issues, right? So the, the solution, the insights, really, and the long-term solution uh, takes efforts, takes conversation and dialogue. So what we aim to do here is to keep, bridge, uh, keep bridging the gap between academic research and industry practice, hopefully providing insights to advance crisis communication effectiveness. So some quick highlights of uh, the process of, of our um, collaborative research. So in a normal time before COVID, uh, as you will see here, we'll be doing uh, uh, in-person meetings and discussion and workshop um, throughout the year. We will have our uh, output list right, in the form of crisis communication conference papers. And most recently, uh, a new book that every single chapter is co-authored by a crisis communication scholar and a crisis 
crisis communication practitioner, uh, either from our membership or via our association by um, um, as co-authors and extended um, uh, network pre-existing. We also did a lot of um, webinar sessions, and this year in April, our, our theme is on e-disruptors. But of course, it will be virtual, but stay tuned. There will be insights and outputs that our group would like to uh, share with many of you in this audience as well. Okay, but so for today, the highlight uh, is focusing on pandemic communication insights. So what have we learned and via different methodological approach and, and uh, via triangulation and via different perspectives from our joint work between academias and uh, practitioner. So uh, today the agenda will go over four major components. One is first of all, what do we learn from history, right? As our first presenter mentioned already, though for a uh, for the process of crisis emergency risk communication takes different waves, right? And then pandemic COVID-19 uh, is not so far the only pandemic as human beings, as human societies, well, since our birth, uh, we, we've been through so many challenges, outbreaks, epidemic and pandemics, right? So what can we learn from what has been done, has been communicated, what's working, what's not working? There are lots of insights and knowledge for us to tap into together. And secondly, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some relatively new uh, theoretical framework uh, that we developed, uh, which can help continue to describe, uh, explain, and potentially help uh, predict uh, current and future pandemic communication efforts. So those will be surrounding um, a outbreak risk am amplification framework and also a, a newer version of the uh, threat appraisal model applied to infectious disease outbreak communication. And last but not least, we're going to share some key insights from recent uh, publications, particularly about uh, crisis communication, about misinformation, and also um, how do we correct misinformation effectively in public health crisis setting. And again, it's it's ongoing. So what we're challenge, what we're dealing here are complex, challenging crisis issues, right? So, but again, uh, at this stage, as we are developing formulas together, uh, uh, let's co-learn and co-create continuously. So, first of all, how do we learn from crisis history? Right, so this project, what this highlights is, is from a recent project that is sponsored, uh, funded by the uh, Arthur Page Center for Integrity in Public Communication, uh, headquartered in Penn State University in the States. So uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic hit all of us, right, so uh, our think tank um, and also our partner of our uh, college, which is the Populations Museum, the Museum of Populations headquartered in New York City. So their director and founder, Shelley Spector, uh, and us, including myself, our doc student, Taylor Volgas, and Lashonda Edi, another think tank member who is now at SMU. So we propose a project to, to look over in the past uh, 100 years, right? So how at least in the US, recent US history, what kind of epidemic, pandemic that the public communication has been through and what are the key lessons learned? So in the next few slides, I'll share with you some highlights, which we initially presented last year uh, at the uh, virtual international conference of the Population Society of America. So first of all, okay, so how do we exploring or uh, well, looking back retrospectively, uh, lessons learned from, pre from previous pandemic communication. So what we did is we examined historical context and the raw materials that the museum populations have the unique access to and provided us as raw materials. So we look at uh, um, key messages, key uh, communication channels, and what kind of influence is evidenced on public. And then we gauge into back then, what are the trust level uh, among government, among media, and also how different brands, how marketers, and how organizations utilize um, a pandemic or epidemic challenge as a way uh, for branding, as a way to uh, doing public good, okay? So quickly, first, um, well, we all remember um, influenza of 1918. Uh, its impact has severe short-term and long-term um, uh, uh, implication um, in multiple countries and multiple continents, right? So here, a quick example is that back then, you know, masks, as we now all wear masks when we are uh, in public space, right? So masks uh, were mandated by law back then in the States. Right, and the mask fashion was actually becoming a uh, part of the American culture, and and also what makes that unique is 
um, back in that time period, trust in health resources were resulted in a lot of um, much better rate of people being compliance of wearing a mask, no, no matter where they are in public space. And so wearing a mask or not was so much less political as we've been seeing, uh, at least in the States, in the past year, in the past, few, uh, past month. Right. And then back then, if you do not wear a mask in America, that could lead to very severe uh, legal consequences, such as uh, getting arrested. In uh, very interesting to see the pictures here. Right. Uh, you can see um, even uh, in the middle, uh, this gentleman wearing a mask and tailored with pipes. So allowing him to smoke, uh, smoke pipes or cigarettes, tobacco use. And then in the middle, uh, left to the gentleman's picture, here are a picture of American football players or <laughs> wearing a mask as they are practicing or playing uh, American football in the field. Okay, and then the next uh, fast forward is you know uh, the polio epidemic in the states, which lasted a longer period of time from 1916 to 1960. Right, so for that um, epidemic, the primary risk or high risk population is young children. So, but that triggered March of Dimes campaign, which has still have a lot of, um, has been having a huge impact to supporting children uh, and, and children's health and support. So, but the roots was beginning in the uh, polio epidemic communication efforts. Really, brief, um, uh, it's a reflection of efforts crossing over uh, public and private sector. And then here um, is the um, how vaccine and vaccination has been promoted. A lot of utilization uh, of uh, PSA, of course, and also um, using um, uh, politicians and uh, powerful musicians, uh, um, icons or pop, um, uh, in influential movie stars and musicians and as as the influencer to say, hey, you know, I get vaccination. It's safe. It's good for you. You should get it too. Right. So this is interesting because we start to see nowadays in various campaigns uh, issued by public uh, health authority, they start to use the same technique right, to use the influential voices of influencers to say, hey, vaccination is safe. Here's video. Here's a live session to showing that, hey, I'm getting vaccinated, so you should do it too. It's safe. And then, um, so the so the next part uh, I'm talk about would be a, a conceptual model that our research team developed. This is back in uh, 2015, right? So for this one, even though we're in the uh, 21st century, but some of those historical uh, components or lessons learned can be plugged in into this map here. We talk about influencers. We talk about uh, public health community, how they issue public campaigns. We talk about how different media channels and reaching general public, right? So what makes um, what social media, what the new technology has changed is the speed and it's how uh, information is being created, amplified and, and received and interpreted uh, in so many different ways, right? So when we published this, um, uh, model in 2015, um, you know, we applied the study in understanding uh, Zika communication, understanding some other public health uh, outbreak risks. But then uh, last year, uh, when we were applying this model, understanding COVID-19 communication, uh, we, our, our lead, uh, lead author uh, received a request from a practitioner team in Lebanon. So somehow our practitioner um, uh, friends encountered our uh, academia journal published uh, model, which we call the SRAMS model, say, hey, this is very interesting. Well, our team want to use this to do training session. You know, but uh, just like in an academia journal, this is kind of you know, makes sense, but lots of tables and summaries, it's, it's, it's becomes really abstract. Can you give us something that's doable, that's uh, easy to be incorporated in that training session? So to respond to that call, um, our group will work with our, our designer to develop a menu to really kind of translate uh, what our initial paper uh, proposed into a infographic format to really outline a different stage of an infectious disease outbreak, uh, including current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Right. So the, during what stage and uh, based on the case number and based upon different channels and different um, audience characteristic, what kind of um, communication message, message, what kind of content, what kind of form uh, based on evidence, based on research that we would uh, recommend for you and your team. 
right? So this has been utilized by practitioners uh, in Lebanon and also in other countries. And this also, we're very proud to include this infographic into our uh, new book, new as of this year, uh, that in one of our chapters, how can we advance crisis communication effectiveness by identifying uh, useful, appliable public relations and crisis communication theories into practice. And another quick example to share with all of you is this um, This article was published uh, late last year, right? So we uh, adapted and integrated crisis literature and some crisis communication um, cognitive appraisal theory into understanding infectious disease threat, right? As our uh, earlier presenter, and it was this very inspirational slide, right? So very often, you know, what frustrates a uh, public health information officer is that, you know, the, the message is crystal clear. You should do this. It's, it's, it's really good for you. Why Why not? Why not uh, uh, take action to protect yourself, right? But very often, you know, it's how, how can we make our message be heard, right? So in order to accomplish that, we really need to understand more about the minds and hearts of our audiences, right? So in this case, um, how do we, how uh, can we know better about uh, how our at-risk populations, how individuals appraise a threat, a threat appraised by a risk, appraised by a, uh, a, a crisis, appraised by emergency situation? Is it predictable? Is there res uh, Who is responsible? <laughs> Myself? Is this I can have control? Or is it up to my government, up to my uh, employer to, to, to take care of? Or, or how controllable it is, right? Is it going, going away in a year or going away in three years, right? So uh, theoretically and conceptually, based on previous uh, research evidence, we, uh, we found that the three categories or three dimensions of appraisal is very powerful predictor of how people are going to feel about the situation and whether and to what degree they are going to take actions in order to cope with their um, uh, the, the very stressful situation um, threatened by infectious disease, right? So how predictable it is, how responsible, who is responsible for the situation resolution and, and how controllable uh, the disease situation is and up to individual or up to others, right? So that will predict how people feel. Do they feel hopeful? Do they feel anxious? Do they feel very angry about um, uh, not effective public health responses? Or um, do they feel just like give up, feel despair, or feel uh, there's no, not much hope left, right? So those positive and negative affective responses can also help predict what they're going to do to cope, right? The coping uh, can take different shapes including seeking information, sharing information, and ultimately is to, based upon the accurate, hopefully, information to take proper action to protect themselves and their loved ones. And hopefully, they can also become an influencer themselves by uh, amplifying the voice, amplifying the accurate uh, information from public health authorities to others on social media. So. And then, uh, after, so, so this study, we uh, collected data uh, in, uh, among U.S. adults uh, using a representative sample. And then we, uh, we have a, rep a replication of a study using a college student sample, still based upon this um, infectious disease threat model we call the IDT appraisal model. Right. So we found similar patterns. Indeed, the three aspects of appraisal, predictability, controllability, and responsibility help uh, predict people's responses in terms of their affective responses, uh, cognitive responses, and behavioral responses, right? But what makes this really interesting is that in this study, right, uh, we grouped positive effect and negative effect together underneath affective reactions. So in this study, we further look into the emotional flow uh, as a process. Right. So here, um, um, let's kind of simplify the labeling here. So for those EAD emotions, are mostly um, attribution based and um, tend to be more, more negative, like anger, uh, sadness or confusion or surprise by what is this? Right. But then what's really interesting is that as people respond to a, a, a threat situation, their initial response um, to deal with the stress is tend to be more negative. Right, and then for, uh, as they start processing the message, there might be more hopeful feeling. Right, so that positivity in the form of hope, if it's being activated, if it's being stimulated, can become a powerful driving force for them to take protective action. 
right? So in, in this sample, we focused on two types of um, inf uh, infectious disease threats that's most um, impactful and severe among U.S. college students, which is respiratory uh, IDT and the sexually transmitted IDT. But across the two uh, disease types, we observed very similar patterns, which means for our uh, resp respondents, for individuals at risk, we appraise what does the situation mean to me, and then we feel, and then we feel even further, and, and then we adjust how we respond to the situation to take action or not, and to what degree. Okay. And then let's switch forward to um, no, in, infodemic management, and particularly uh, about the challenge of misinformation. Right. So in, for, uh, for this topic, I would like to uh, share with uh, one of the uh, recent study, which is published in 2020, uh, uh, co-authored by uh, Dr. Tony Vandermeer, whom I believe is in the, actually today, the webinar uh, audience. Hi, Tony. And so for this study, uh, Tony and I, we focused on a public health crisis situation. We used hypothetical uh, crisis situation happening in the U.S. And then we used, we used U.S. adult sample to see, okay, so after misinformation uh, exposure, and then we provide corrective information to counter the false information. So what works, right? So we look at sources, uh, uh, people, uh, we, we compared the effects of government agencies, news media, social peers uh, as one factor. And then we also look at the role of, uh, of, of different strategy to counter misinformation. Uh, should, we, should we just have a simple rebuttal, say you are wrong, this is misinformation, don't believe them. Or should we further using a uh, narrative, using storytelling approach or to strengthen the factual uh, substance to elaborate with what we call the uh, factual elaboration to see which one works better, which combination of these two factors might become powerful uh, tools to recommend to practitioners combating misinformation, right? So let me quickly re uh, uh, recap here. So what we tested in this online experiment are two uh, focal independent variables. One is whose voice, who is telling, who is correcting, right? So government agency, news media versus social peer. Secondly, is the correction, corrective message strategy, simple rebuttal versus factual elaboration. So what we found is that, first of all, correction uh, works way better than not, not, not make any correction in terms of mis uh, mis misperception, uh, realignment, and, um, and also behavior outcome in taking uh, following recommendation from, from public health authorities. OK, and then but between the correct message strategy, factual elaboration works better. So which means when we correct misinformation, we must always tell more truth and back, back, uh, back truth up with more factual information. And secondly, in terms of sources, we found that government agencies and news media are more powerful, more persuasive than social peers, which I think this is really good news for public health uh, authorities and also for, for our media professionals out there, right? And then we also look into um, emotional responses. We found that emotions are powerful mediators um, in, in understanding uh, to what degree and how a correction would work in combating infodemic. Right. So if we can, if our correct message can trigger proper level of fear, proper level of anxiety that can generate or, or motivate more um, productive action taking or more intended behavior outcome. We also found that if we combine factual elaboration with the sources from government agency and news media, and also if in those conditions when hope as a powerful positive emotion is generated among receivers, yeah, uh, which will trigger them much more likely to follow uh, instruction uh, uh, given inaccurate information and then taking swift actions to protect themselves and their family and loved ones, right? So here are the key takeaway from this study. And then uh, most recently, uh, um, I work with a team of scholars uh, in UK uh, and also in, in Brazil. So this project- Yes, I apologize. Can you keep this relatively short and oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, this is what well, we're working already quickly now. Yeah, so in this case, we compared um, not, not just looking into misinformation uh, as uh, totally false, totally not factual. We compared different shades of truth. We call that here's accurate information, here's uh, total uh, misinformation. In the middle, we have different shades. It's like first, it's, those are very sneaky type of misinformation. Maybe 50% of the information is actually accurate, but the other half uh, is actually incorrect, right? But what we found is that when we we um, uh, conducted an experiment in UK and, and Brazil, adult population. We compared age, older generation, younger generation. We look at how different age group, based upon literature, saying that they have different level of misinformation vulnerability. So compare age and the different shades of uh, truth exposure. So what, what can we learn from, right? What we found is that, yeah, the most uh, dangerous type of misinformation when it comes to COVID-19, um, at least in our study, is those half-truths. They look like truths. They have some uh, um, factual information. However, the way they frame that information, the way they, uh, uh, they, they talk about uh, treatment of uh, using half-truths is most dangerous. That makes people even more vulnerable in believing um, misinformation and also in sharing mis uh, misinformation. But we can also elaborate this more in our discussion session. So, and I want to conclude uh, my session uh, with that no. So continuing with our conversation with practitioners, right? So I really like uh, this quote from a PRSA practitioner last year. So this person wrote about, you know, COVID-19. We don't know when COVID-19 will end eventually and how those waves will be uh, finally seeded, right? But we know that COVID-19 has fundamentally changed how businesses, governments, and public institutions and leaders plan for and manage crisis. Right, and it is called for uh, endurance. It's a time to call for more uh, collaboration to co-advance uh, our knowledge in crisis and emergency communication. So on that note, um, I'm looking forward to more dialogue and discussion and thank all of you for your attention. Thank you for the brilliant presentation. Thank you, Jan. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Any very quick questions, anything unclear? Okay, you're getting praise, Jan, in the chat. Oh, thank you. Such as the speaker before. Okay, as we're um, already, um, we do have a little time lag already, so I'll just quickly hand over to our next speaker, Matt Seeger, and he's going to talk about communicating death and dying during crises, uncertainty, equivocality, and strategic ambiguity. Looking forward to it. The stage is yours. Matt, please. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you can hear me and see my slides. I'm delighted to have a chance uh, to speak with you today about uh, some of the work we've been doing in the area of crisis and emergency risk communication. I will try to be very efficient in my uh, presentation today to respect our time, but uh, as we go forward through the slides, if anyone would like additional information, my email address is included here. Feel free to reach out to me. So my purpose today is to uh, frame uh, the fundamental question of crisis communication inquiry as I see it and to sort of establish a general framework for talking about one specific project that illustrates the role of communication within that particular frame. Uh, this is a follow up to an investigation that we did with the Hurricane uh, Maria incident, which hit, hit Puerto Rico and a, a large uh, effort to clarify the number of deaths that occurred with regard to that particular disaster. Uh, I also will conclude with some research questions that I will propose uh, for helping drive uh, our understanding of crisis communication forward. So the fundamental question of, uh, of crisis communication, the fundamental characteristic of crisis is that it creates uncertainty and surprise and loss of meaning, uh, a loss of a sense of normal. Kara Weick called this the cosmology episode uh, our colleagues in anthropology talk about liminality, and some of our uh, studies have also talked about denarration. But the fundamental characteristic of, of a crisis is that there is inadequate information, there is a, a loss of any sense of normalcy or predictability in the event, which makes it very difficult for us to know what to do and how to move forward. This is the fundamental problem, in my judgment, that crisis communication seeks to address. And much of our work, in fact, most of our work, I think, can fit in this larger question of uncertainty, surprise, loss of meaning, denarration. 
So with that uh, view, uh, a definition then of crisis uh, that comes from our most recent book uh, with Tim Sonow, Theorizing Crisis Communication, a crisis is an event or series of events that's situated in place and time that disrupts this fundamental sense of normalcy, including the established and predictable patterns of social and environmental support, interaction, roles, routines, order, relationships, all of which are used to help us make sense of uh, what is happening uh, in, in the world. And so we need to, to uh, use communication to reconstitute a sense of normalcy and a sense of information. So the questions, the fundamental questions that we often uh, ask following a crisis are interestingly those questions that any good journalist might ask following a crisis. What happened? Why? Who caused this to happen? What should I or what should we do as a community? When will this be over and will this ever happen again? And if we look at our research, much of our research in crisis communication, we can see that much of that research can be understood within the framework of trying to address these particular questions. So the what should I do question, the idea model that uh, Tim Salnow and Deanna Salnow have developed in terms of uh, uh, crisis communication clearly fits in that question of what should I do. Uh, some of the work that Yan Jin discussed also fits into this question of what should I do or efficacy, how, how can I take some action in response to this event. What caused this to happen and who is to blame? Well, uh, uh, the uh, SCCT uh, work of Tim Coombs clearly fits into this question of blame and responsibility, as does the image restoration theory of Bill Benoit. What does this mean? Uh, the concept of narration, narrative theory, the sense-making work of Carl Weick very clearly fits into this larger question of meaning. Uh, what are we doing to ensure that this does not happen again? The discourse of renewal work, uh, crisis learning, which uh, Yan Jen also mentioned, the concept of resilience clearly fits into this final question of, of, of what are we doing to ensure that this kind of event will not happen again. So as I mentioned, you know, the fundamental question of, of crisis as I understand it, and I think as much of our work suggests, is this idea of uncertainty. And of course, the communication field has been talking about uncertainty for a long time and uh, how communication relates to this concept of uncertainty. So this particular definition of uncertainty comes from Dale Bashers, who was one of the uh, principal theorists uh, around the discussions of uncertainty in communication. He argued that uncertainty exists when details of situations are ambiguous, complex, unpredictable, probabilistic, where information is unavailable or inconsistent, and where people feel insecure in their own state of knowledge. That partic those particular conditions, in my judgment, are excellent descriptions of a crisis. Those conditions of inadequate information, complex, ambiguous, probabilistic, are excellent descriptions of what a crisis might look like. So there are two general theoretical frameworks that address the concept of uncertainty. Uh, one is the very traditional uncertainty reduction theory, which comes from Berger and Calabrese, uh, 1975, which simply states that uncertainty is an uncomfortable state, a stress-inducing state, a state that encourages communication activities designed to reduce uncertainty. So those might involve information searching activities, for example, uh, questioning, collecting information in order to address the uncertainty that's faced. Uncertainty management theory is a more recent theory developed by Dale Bashers, as I mentioned earlier, and Bashers argues that uncertainty is un unavoidable, it's neutral, it is a natural state that all uh, humans exist in, and it is a matter of perception and tolerance varies. So the problem is not really reducing uncertainty, but the, the problem is really one of how do we man manage the uncertainty based on our varying needs and, and uh, uh, tolerance for uh, uncertainty. So let me talk then about the current project uh, and situate it within this larger uh, question of uncertainty and equivocality, uh, denarration in a crisis situation. This particular project is communicating death and dying in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I uh, finished this uh, project recently with one of my graduate students, William Nowling. And this will be coming, for, coming out in a forthcoming volume, Communicating Science in Times of Crisis, 
published by Wiley Blackwell, edited by Dan O'Hare. Uh, some of you probably know Dan O'Hare's work in uh, crisis and risk communication. <clears throat> so um, one of the uh, important characteristics that that I've been looking at in is I as I think about you know how we come to understand crises, how do we come to understand events, is this notion of death and dying. You know how many people have become sick, how many people are ill, how many people have died, uh, and and how we collect data around these issues and how this data helps us understand what an event really looks like. So the World Health Organization notes that an important characteristic of an infectious disease, certainly one like COVID-19, is its severity. And the ultimate measure is the ability to cause death. So fatality rates help us understand the severity of a disease, identify at-risk populations, and evaluate the quality of health care. So this data, this data about death and dying, mortality and morbidity, is really critical in help us, helping us understand uh, a, a particular event, but it's not necessarily the kind of data that we've thought of as a communication problem. And in this paper, we really try to understand this as a communication, a crisis communication problem. So uh, part of the problem is that there is significant levels of misinformation, and we've had really good discussion from our two other panelists about uh, distortion of information, uh, fake news, all the things that have really surrounded this particular episode, which have been very, very endemic here in the United States. At the same time, we have significant levels of misinformation. We have pressure for accurate, timely information. Because this is a moment of high uncertainty, people are seeking to reduce their uncertainty by collecting information. And we have a need to develop communication systems, uh, credible communication systems to provide that information. What you see below there is a dashboard which was developed uh, by my uh, graduate student, William Nowling. He is responsible for uh, putting data out to the public about the numbers of, of mortality and morbidity, the data in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And so when he came to me and said, you know, I, as part of my job, uh, I have to prepare this information. Uh, can you help me? Uh, we worked to develop ways to present this information uh, to help people understand uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and how it was affecting them, to help them reduce their uncertainty. So let me talk a little bit about perception of COVID-19 generally. We know a lot about how risks are perceived. Uh, we know that novel viruses, unfair viruses, viruses of exotic origins uh, uh, are going to create higher perceptions of risk. We know that stigmatization of particular communities associated with a disease is quite common. We know that risks that are involuntary are seen as more risky than other factors. And we know that inconsistent information and inconsistent messaging will enhance the perception of uncertainty, perhaps enhance the level of uncertainty and the perception of risk. And it's hard to overstate how um, uh, problematic the ecosystem uh, for COVID-19 has been, particularly in the United States. It has become a very political uh, question. We have fake news. We have deniers of various sorts. It really has been quite shocking, I think, to many of us uh, to see the level of disinformation, in many cases, intentional different disinformation surrounding COVID-19. And I think as we consider this risk communication moment, we have to consider the larger communication ecosystem that has surrounded this particular uh, pandemic. So in addition, the, uh, the COVID-19 has created uh, unprecedented disruption. Uh, it has converged with the uh, Black Lives Matters uh, issue in the United States and questions, long-term questions of social justice. It's been a cascading event. There have been unanticipated interactions around uh, COVID-19. I think most universities did not anticipate that they would be shut down for a year from face-to-face -face instruction based on COVID-19. And of course, there have been conflicting messages. I also think that it's important to recognize that, that broadly, we have a hard time determining you know, how many people have been injured or how many people have died from various kinds of, of crises and disasters. And if you just look at these, these particular cases, you see there's quite a range uh, of different cases, some of which can be accounted for by simply the time. I mean, the 1918 pandemic was many years back, but Hurricane Maria, which was relatively recent, our estimates range from 64 deaths to over 3,000. 
So let me talk a little bit about the functions of mortality and morbidity data. And this is a really interesting discussion informed a little bit by disaster sociologists Lindell and Prater. Um, mortality and morbidity data serves as a metric for the overall level of harm. That's what the World Health Organization indicated. It helps create situational awareness so we know you know, in this particular location, there are more deaths or more has hospitalizations than in other situations. It informs decisions and response strategies. You know, do we really need to wear masks? Uh, where can we deploy resources? Uh, what other mitigation strategies would be appropriate in this, this circumstance? It helps me assess my personal risk, my community risk, my organizational risk. It can determine impact on specific populations and locations. We know that COVID-19 has had a very disproportional impact, for example, on uh, communities of color in the United States, and data can help us understand that. It assesses the effectiveness of inter interventions. It can inform policy, and it can promote and inform preparedness. So this data on mortality and morbidity, which I think most communication people haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, really serves a very critical function in helping people understand, fundamentally understand their level of risk. And it also informs a lot of our strategies in response to those circumstances. So fundamentally, it helps reduce our uncertainty. So what is reported when we talk about uh, a pandemic or an infectious disease outbreak? Well, the first thing that's important to recognize is that we need a common case definition. You know, what is COVID-19? And because this was a novel uh, uh, emerging disease, it took a long time for epidemiologists and others to really determine, you know, what is a case of COVID-19? Typically, we then report incidence rates, prevalence rates, hospitalizations, and of course, uh, morbidity and mortality. So let me just give a couple of quick definitions to some of these terms because they may be uh, relatively novel to some of the, some of us. Incident rate is simply the number of new cases as a, of a disease di divided by the population, uh, the total population at risk. Prevalence is a measure of the total number of cases of disease existing in a population at a particular time. And comorbidity is a really important term. This is the simultaneous presence of two or more diseases or medical conditions in a single patient. And in the United States, our reporting system for uh, infectious diseases is run through the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System. Uh, this is a very decentralized system. It relies on information compiled from over 3,000 local and state health departments. This is one of the problems with reporting mortality and morbidity data. <clears throat> it's very decentralized and relies on, on local and state health departments, which have varying level of expertise and funding. The reporting process typically is a running total of deaths uh, or, or illness. Uh, typically, it's grounded in the, in the uh, identifiable formal cause of death. What's important to recognize is that, at least in the United States, we do not test cadavers. So if someone died at home, for example, uh, and had not had a previous diagnosis of COVID-19, they would not be counted in the overall death statistics. The data is compiled from local sources, and again, there are lots of challenges given the decentralized nature of that data. These challenges include sort of the general fog of war. Um, crises and disasters, including pandemics, are very disruptive. People are engaged in managing other things. They may simply not be able to, to collect information and communicate the information. Cause of death is, is uh, the formal definition, and that's determined at the local level. There's also the principle of excess deaths, which is the number of deaths beyond uh, what we would have experienced in a normal time uh, from, from a particular disease. So right now, uh, the excess deaths associated with COVID-19 are about a third. Most estimates place them about a third. So we have about 2.26 million deaths right now uh, from COVID-19 worldwide. Uh, most uh, experts suggest that really that number should be closer to 3 million, perhaps even a little larger than 3 million. Case definition, as I mentioned, is really important. There are reporting lag times. It takes time to compile this data. The public's ability to understand data is quite limited. So, um, you know, reporting things like inc incidence rates and, more, and, and uh, prevalence rates may not be clear to people. 
We do not test cadavers, as I indicated. Local sources are problematic. We have very vari variable reporting methods. And we also have, interestingly enough, intentional manipulation of data, usually for political purposes. So this is January 2021. These, these numbers have actually been uh, up, uh, updated. I was looking at that this morning. Uh, we're, we're at about 2.26 million deaths, according to uh, the World Health Organization. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. North America continues to lead the number of deaths uh, for a wide variety of reasons, which is uh, really disconcerting to us in, in the United States and North America. Some of our recommendations for how to approach, you know, better uh, understanding of mortality and morbidity so that uh, we can reduce the uncertainty and help people really understand what's going on. The standardized definitions and systems, norm, uh, normative systems for reporting, uh, testing of cadavers, as I indicated, and putting the data out in very, very accessible form. Uh, the public has a very difficult time processing data, and we see a lot of misinformation and rumors and fake news being fed by the fact that data is not in accessible form. So in terms of a larger research agenda, you know, some of the questions that, that we propose, which I think are, are general questions which are useful for the crisis communication field in general, is how can uncertainty, liminality, loss of meaning, denarration be managed through our communication processes? What are the specific and various forms of information and communication that can contribute to this management? How can we meet the needs of people for information? How can these communication processes be made more efficient and effective for diverse stakeholders? And then finally, in what ways does uncertainty management and reduction facilitate preparation, response, recovery, resilience, and renewal? So thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention. I'll look forward to any questions in the comments, and I have just a few references uh, in, in, in my slides uh, just because I have to include references. So thank you very much and uh, happy to, uh, to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you, Matt, for the brilliant and thought-provoking presentation. As uh, after every keynote, I'm asking the audience, is there any quick and urgent question, something to clarify? If not, I want to thank you, uh, Matt. And looking forward to uh, the discussion where we will certainly raise several points that you've raised just now uh, in your presentation. Thank you. And now it's Andreas' turn. Um, he's going to present, Andreas Schwartz from Immenau University, he's going to present on internal risk and crisis communication on the COVID-19 pandemic, global experiences of higher education institutions. So that's an organizational uh, perspective that is going to contribute, which I think is a very, very uh, nice and uh, worthwhile add to today's program. Andreas. Yes, hello, Florian. Um, can you see the my screen and the presentation? Yes, we can. Very good. OK, hello. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Florian, Audra, and Silvia for the invitation um, to be on that panel and um, talk to you um, in the career crisis communication section. And um, yeah, so this will be um, about a study that is basically currently ongoing. We are still in the middle of analyzing the data. It's a qualitative study, so a lot of um, text to read, especially interview transcripts, um, which I was doing uh, still until shortly before that presentation. So it's really work in progress, and I have some uh, preliminary results and especially preliminary conclusions for you um, here. It's all about um, understanding instructional risk and crisis communication messages um, created and distributed to internal publics at universities around the world during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, I'll get to more details in a minute. And uh, we were also interested in understanding um, the communication skills and competencies that those university communicators actually have or apply across countries when they do risk communication on COVID-19 with their internal publics. Um, and also we were asking for the challenges that they um, have faced in that situation that they are still facing right now. 
Yeah, so in terms of the relevance, we are trying to contribute with that study to the lack of cross-cultural risk and crisis communication research in general, but especially beyond uh, the very much researched um, areas such as the United States or Europe, um, which Audra has shown very impressively in her uh, literature study on the state of the art and uh, risk and crisis communication. Um, we also applied the idea model here and tested that model from an organizational perspective. So, so how much can it help us to understand message creation from this organizational or the communicators perspective? And we will also try to deduce some lessons for best practices here, especially for universities. So the, the that kind of organization that many of us are working for actually. Yeah, so this was our uh, guiding model, um, the idea model developed by uh, Timothy Selnow and Deanna Selnow and some other colleagues who have contributed to that research. Um, it's a model that is mainly centered on uh, let's say message creation when it comes to risk communication. So what elements should um, effective risk messages include in order to achieve um, the rather high degrees of protection motivation in a um, public that is at risk, for example, in a pandemic such as COVID-19. And uh, the model argues that um, there are three very important elements that should be included and always combined in order to achieve the best results on protection motivation. So one is internalization where you explain your public um, why it is affected and how and you do that through explaining, uh, showing compassion, explaining the, the personal relevance, how close it is to them in terms of proximity, um, etc. When it comes to explanation, it is about um, explaining what happened, why and when, by using credible sources, including accurate science, but also translating that science into a language that your audience understands. And third, it is action. Um, it is um, communicating about what um, the potentially affected publics should do, how they should behave in order to um, protect, protect themselves, but also what the responsible institutions are doing to protect them, for example. So it's about efficacy and self-efficacy. The fourth element is distribution, and it addresses the challenge of um, communication channels that should be used to reach the target audience to get the message across. Um, and the model also argues that there should be an overlap of multiple channels uh, delivering a consistent message because it would raise credibility of that message and also increase protection motivation in uh, within the public at risk. So this is more or less the model that we um, applied. Um, obviously, the model has some overlaps with other well-known models in risk communication, such as the extended parallel process model and protection motivation theory. Um, but um, that is a discussion for, for another platform, I think. But this was our uh, yeah, um, guiding model. We used these dimensions uh, to deduce questions that we asked our interviewees um, in that study. And I quickly want to uh, introduce you and show you um, um, the persons who actually helped me in conducting the interviews. So uh, we conducted that study in the context of a research module, a research seminar in my um, in our master program in media and communication science at TU Ilmenau. So um, when the pandemic happened, uh, on short notice, I asked my students if they would be interested in um, throwing our idea what to do in that module overboard and do a study on COVID-19 communication. They all agreed and that was perfect for me as well because uh, my students come from basically all over the world. So we were able to conduct interviews uh, um, in a lot of very different corners of the world. And our aim was to approach university communicators to see how they communicate with um, students, with staff, with professors and other internal publics. Um, we also chose that object of analysis because students have an understanding of that environment and world and would be able to conduct the interviews, obviously. Yeah, and I also would like to thank my students um, um, to participate in that, conduct the interviews and deliver some of the data. Um, for now, I saw Alberto in uh, the audience. So hello, Alberto, uh, and thank you for contributing to that study. 
So what we did is we um, conducted interviews with university communicators around the world. Here you see the countries that we included. For each country, we try to identify um, at least two universities, if possible, uh, bigger universities, a public one and a private one, depending on the local education system, obviously, and in each university to address um, one of the main communicators that would be in charge of internal uh, COVID-19 response and communication. Um, so um, we were able to cover um, a lot of these countries, um, many countries around the world and on most of the continents except um, Australia. Um, but still the resulting sample was quite heterogeneous. So in total we included 18 countries. However, I told you it's still work in progress. So far, we have been able to finalize the analysis of um, for nine different countries, including 20 interviews who cover in total 17 universities, public and private universities. So the results that I um, can show you today or some of the results are from these countries, Canada, El Salvador, France, Germany, Bulgaria, Russia, Cameroon, Pakistan and Vietnam. So we for now, so far, we try to include some of the different corners of the world and to see if um, they are facing different kinds of challenges in their risk communication. Um, this is the sample of interviews that we included. Um, so in most of the countries we conducted uh, two interviews in France and Canada, uh, three interviews. And you see we, we have some heterogeneity in the sample because in some countries like Canada, France, uh, El Salvador, Russia, etc. Um, we were able to convince some of the high ranked communicators like heads of the communication departments, etc., to take part in the study. In some other countries, um, we talked to employees or social media managers who were a little bit lower in the hierarchy. So obviously this can influence the results and the oversight that they have in general on risk communication in their institutions. OK, so here are some of the results. Uh, first of all, what are the target audiences they mainly address so that you understand uh, what kind of people we were talking to and what kind of people they addressed in their risk communication? So basically we had quite some good overlap with internal publics here. So most of these communicators were addressing students, lecturers, researchers, professors and their administrative staff internally. So we have we established a good, let's say, sampling equivalence across countries here. Um, some noteworthy differences are that, for example, in Bul Bulgaria and Canada, they also addressed uh, their alumni. Um, in Canada, also in addition to that, government and donors, uh, which also matter especially in contexts of um, private universities, for example. In Cameroon, they also uh, addressed uh, yeah, their cleaners, so the, the personnel and staff um, you know, that is basically cleaning the offices, uh, but also sanitizing them, for example. Um, interesting was the case of El Salvador, uh, the university we um, approached there because they said our public has become everyone. Um, because, uh, and that was the description of the interviewee, the government was not doing such a great job in informing the public in the country about uh, the pandemic and the things to do and the actual risk. So many experts from that university um, uh, rose to become the national communicators and were uh, like the most credible or one of the most used sources for the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Some other universities also addressed uh, prospective students. So um, yeah, high school students, for example, that might or would apply to their universities, um, but also parents of the students and one interview in Pakistan especially addressed the needs of disabled people or people with disabilities um, that need special information and, and a special degree of empathy. Um, and he mentioned that a lot of them are basically forgotten in the country, so they specifically address them in their university. So here are some preliminary results from our analysis of transcripts of these uh, interviews. Um, here you see the measures are coding decisions per transcript, so they're uh, basically um, just telling us or telling you um, how many coding decisions we made for each transcript on average per country on the different dimensions of the idea model. 
internalization, distribution, explanation, and action. And you can see that we did um, a lot of coding decisions for the distribution part since, first of all, a lot of these interviewees focus very much on distribution and they were able to name all their channels that they used. Yeah? So this explains this high number of coding decisions. Not much was said or talked about um, internalization, for example, on the other hand. So how do you make it relevant to your public? Uh, how do you how do you show uh, compassion, etc.? So that was not such a big deal uh, in the interviews as compared to other topics such as tell them what to do, action, um, or where do you distribute your message? Now we go a little bit deeper into the internalization dimension where we looked at several sub dimensions, for example, compassion. So uh, do these communicators at university show compassion and empathy with their publics internally? How do they address personal relevance? Um, how do they uh, sh show that there is some proximity to uh, potentially affected publics? Um, we address timeliness and ask them about the exemplification. So if they use certain exemplars, examples, pictures, videos or something to um, um, uh, make that message more uh, convincing or more comprehensible. Um, and as an outcome, we could see that, for example, our uni or the universities or interviewees in El Salvador, Pakistan and Vietnam um, seemed to emphasize a lot on compassion and personal relevance. At least they had to, a lot to say about it. Whereas others like uh, in Germany, um, for example, didn't talk too much about that. Um, on the other hand, in Germany and Cameroon, but also Pakistan, a lot of ex exemplification was part of that process. Now, when we look a little bit more in the qualitative part of the analysis, um, here's the case of El Salvador for internalization. Um, so they talked quite a bit about um, compassion, for example. Um, so they were trying to use inspiring messages. Um, um, they focused on families um, of the students um, or the professors, for example, um, and that they should do certain things to protect themselves, also to take into account their parents, their children beyond themselves, for example. Um, they also thought about psychological and mental illnesses and problems that students might have, so they started offering online courses on that to support students with their psychological issues that was a big deal um, in that university for um, in El Salvador, for example. When it comes to personal relevance, um, um, there was a lot of insurance in the messages that they tried to um, apply. They tried to make it uh, relevant, at least that's what they told us. Um, and uh, they were talking about the combination of rational and emotional elements in their messages, but especially the emotional part would be important. Um, where they addressed family ties, uh, ties with their loved ones, and the rational part would address um, um, more specific information about the spread of the virus. Also very much a topic relating to compassion um, was our interview um, in Pakistan or interviews in Pakistan. Um, um, it sounded a little bit more dramatic here. We want to keep them alive. We want to give them hope. We wanted to make them realize that life is not ended. Um, so they um, did, for example, TV series and short videos um, to show people how they can manage this pandemic mentally, but also uh, physically because a lot of people um, would be in shock. Um, and this is also the interview that um, where he talked about uh, people with disabilities and that they have special needs and need special kinds of risk response and information. Um, yeah, and then they also try to do some more entertaining parts in order to support people at home because they are basically locked in their homes, just moving between bathroom and bedroom. So um, they did some videos on uh, kitchen activities and things like that to support their students, for example. Yeah, uh, and also personal relevance was um, addressed here uh, in a similar way, like in El Salvador, for example. Now, another example where internalization was not very important is Germany. So the interviews we conducted there basically showed us um, that um, at least these communicators didn't attribute a lot of importance to that. 
Um, so they told us, yeah, the attention is already there. It's naturally there by the situation. We don't have to underline that in addition to that. So we didn't take any special measures here. Um, and also they said, yeah, we didn't make that too explicit in terms of personal relevance. It's just based on the assumption. Yeah, it's already there. They, they know it's relevant. Yeah? Um, and we found similar answers for our interviews in Canada, for example. Uh, so in some countries, internalization, compassion, etc., was not important in the crafting of messages and risk communication. Yeah? Uh, possibly a limitation in this um, in, in our practice. Now, when it comes to distribution, uh, you can see there were a lot of coding decisions per transcript for the channels that were used by the communicators. Obviously, that is something that, that they could easily um, tell us. Um, this is, explains the spikes in this in the coding decisions. Um, for Russia, for example, our interview did not talk a lot, did not talk a, a lot about how they adapt their messages to the channels and the, while the other interviewees um, did so and told us. And in general, they did not talk much about message coordination with other institutions, like um, with with whom and how and why they coordinate messages in order to keep them consistent, for example. Um, um, in, in many cases, there was simply no coordination um, happening. Uh, I mean, not much beyond taking over messages from the government or health ministries. In terms of the communication channels, um, the most used channels across countries in, in most countries were websites, emails and Facebook. Um, only in Cameroon, they didn't use email because um, their students would not read emails anyways. And by the way, we heard a lot of side notes in the interviews that increasingly students are not reading their emails or missing their emails. This is why they, in addition to email, they have to use other channels, especially social media, to get to their students and inform them about ongoing problems, pandemics and emergencies. Especially Facebook was considered to be very effective here. Uh, interestingly, in countries in two countries, especially Cameroon and Pakistan, WhatsApp was used very intensively. Uh, WhatsApp groups and it was perceived as the, as the most effective channel um, since uh, obviously students are using that channel uh, very much and have it open all the time. So information uh, gets across very easily and um, quickly. Um, also, interpersonal communication played a role in five countries. Personal communication was mentioned in four countries. Uh, Zoom and video chat applications were mentioned. Traditional media play a role only in certain countries, such as local newspapers and radio. Radio, for example, was important in Cameroon, uh, Canada, Pakistan and Vietnam. In Cameroon and uh, Vietnam and so on, but also Pakistan, it is important um, because a lot of students live in rural areas where there basically is no uh, internet coverage or very uh, weak internet coverage. So um, these uh, channels are very important there. Yeah, message coordination with other institutions. I already mentioned that it does not seem to happen too much, at least according to our interviewees. Um, most of them mention that uh, they coordinate or take over messages from their health ministries. Some others mention the education ministries or the labor ministries. Um, apart from that, not too much um, coordination is going on. In some countries, they coordinate with other universities in order to keep the messages more or less consistent. For example, in Canada, um, they did that. Um, and um, it was also mentioned, I think, in Vietnam. All right, now we come to explanation as another dimension in the idea model. Here we looked at um, credible sources, how much they would be used and cited at uh, accurate signs as emphasized in their messages. Um, also important was intelligible translation. So how much is scientific information translated for layman persons or specific publics? And again, exemplification. Um, and here we saw that, um, for example, in France and Germany, um, explanation played a minor role in crafting of messages um, compared to the other countries. At least the interviewees uh, didn't talk too much about it. Um, and overall, the topic of using accurate science, accurate science was not 
uh, very much talked about. So usually they mention that, yeah, we just take the information we get from um, our sources and uh, um, transmit that to our publics. Usually the, the sources that would be used and are deemed to be credible were the World Health Organization, the national health authorities, um, in many universities, vi um, the local vi virologists and experts in their own university uh, were used as uh, sources and experts. Um, in El Salvador, they also used mathematicians who uh, de developed models to explain the spread and uh, further development of the pandemic. Um, in Viet only in Vietnam, um, official media and newspapers, so the state media basically were mentioned as uh, sources as well. When it comes to translating your message to the public, um, especially scientific information, this was highly emphasized by our interviewees in Bulgaria, Cameroon and Pakistan. Um, it was very much downplayed by, by our interviewees in Canada, France and Germany, who would argue that yeah, we are getting good information from our uh, ministries and the government. We don't need to do much translation uh, here and also um, here's an example of that. For example, our Canadian interviewees argued, yeah, our students are, are quite intelligent. They can handle scientific information, so we do not have to edit that um, and which or we link to other experts who can take over the challenge. Excuse now when me, it comes to yes, yes, um, this is also the gentle reminder that uh, you can please come to an end soon. OK, OK, I will hurry. Thanks a lot. OK, final dimension of the idea model is action. Um, there was broad consensus across all countries. They all communicated the same actions and behaviors. Wash hands, wear masks, social distancing, etc. In uh, Bulgaria, Canada and Germany, they emphasized that it's important to make clear to those students it's voluntary. Yeah? This is our recommendation. Do it if you want. Yeah? We don't force you. Um, because they think it's important, because if you try to force them, it uh, will create reactance or um, a reluctance of students to adapt to these um, measures. OK, then very shortly to the competencies for risk and crisis communication. Um, so how skillful and competent or educated are these communicators to conduct risk and crisis communication? 11 out of 20 of our interviewees uh, had a formal degree in communication or something related to that. And then the situation gets very sad when it comes to books on risk and crisis communication. We had one interviewee who uh, looked at a book or several books by Grunig, Coombs and Parsons. Um, in terms of models and theories of risk and crisis communication, the situation is also not very promising from our perspective of scholars. Um, so one said, they work with two-step flow theory, information communication models were mentioned, um, and basically the others said, yeah, we didn't have time. Um, theory doesn't help us in practice. Um, in the future, we should look it up um, um, or simply no. Um, most of, no, all of them told us, yeah, we rely on personal experience. I have worked in communication. I do that by intuition. Um, uh, I worked 10 years in communication. Um, it is a trial and error approach, etc. So uh, experience or lower degrees of professionalism are still dominating here in the field. Courses and trainings were almost not attended in any case. Uh, only one, the communicator in Pakistan mentioned that they used the WHO uh, risk communication guidelines. That was an interesting single case here. OK, I have to skip, unfortunately, the challenges and negative reactions. Uh, there were cases of misinformation. There were, was backlash among the students. Um, um, there were cases in El Salvador where students were attacked that would be willing to be des testimonials for the university communicators. And there was a lot of struggle about tuition fees because um, a lot of students asked for lowering or cutting the tuition fees because classes were not taking place or just online. OK, conclusions. Um, we found the idea model useful to study message creations at these organizations. So um, it is a good basis to have these conversations and understand how this process works. Most dimensions seem to be relevant for these communicators, although not really consciously or systematically. 
not so much they emphasize internalization and in some cases explanation. Overall, we discovered a very low competence for risk and crisis communication compared to the knowledge that is out there that probably should be used to some extent. Um, we also conclude for now that most of our theories in risk communication do not really cover multi-level crises because COVID-19 showed us um, there is not only a health crisis, there is a socioeconomic crisis, there is a political crisis, there is a racism crisis and uh, many other things. And these models are simply not able to cover that and do not tell us how to deal with communication in, uh, in that situation. Um, these theories are still low in scope. They have they are low range. They're either message centered or they are process centered or something like that, but they don't uh, bring it together. And this is something we urgently need to develop in the future. And unfortunately, I don't have time to explain you that, but um, what we basically need is a model that is able to combine the different factors on the organizational and institutional level with the uh, level of perception, communication and messages. Um, and we know a lot of the variables in our different models and theories. We just have not brought them together. And I think this will be um, our main task in the future in order to be better prepared for pandemics like COVID-19. Also, the conflicts of interest among publics when it comes to multi-level crisis is something we urgently have to take into account and study. OK, um, that's it. I would like to thank you for your attention and also I would like to thank again my students who helped conducting all these interviews. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas, for this really interesting and rich presentation and it's really amazing uh, the work that your students have done. So uh, big hello from our side and thanks a lot for the interesting data. OK, so um, these were our four keynotes um we're all already quite